standing before you is to introduce our speaker, whose name is Ross Virginia. Uh, I hardly know how to introduce him. He has so many things going on. Uh, he has spent 15 uh, seasons in the Antarctic doing research there, and five seasons in the Arctic doing research there. He is essentially, as an academic, he's essentially uh, an ecologist and an environmentalist. But he's also the director of the Arctic Institute at Dartmouth College, and uh, as such, he is very interested in interpreting his scientific information and the science that's going on in the Arctic program to people like us, so that we can kind of make the connection between what's happening in the environment and what's happening politically. So uh, without describing that any further, we are so fortunate to have this very lively person, uh, Dr. Virginia. Thank you very much, Margo. I want to thank everyone here for the opportunity to be here this evening. And, um, so what I'd like to do tonight is maybe share with you uh, some of the science and so around climate change in the north and why I think it's important for everyone to have some understanding of that. But then what I'd like to do is sort of connect that science to the current geopolitical debate around the future of the Arctic. And it's very international, it's very lively, and um, you can't open up a newspaper these days and not see something about melting ice and oil development and impacts on indigenous peoples. And these are all really important, rich issues. Uh, I, I teach these at, at Dartmouth College. I have students that are engaged in these issues. And I work with a lot of co colleagues, both from the sciences and the political sciences, on these issues. So what I'd like to do is run through some of this stuff. Um, if you have questions, please stop me. And I, I, Definitely want to have time for discussion and maybe even debate on some of these things as we move through this. Okay? okay. This is one of my favorite maps of the Arctic. You know, we're looking at the North Pole here. We've stripped the water away. You're looking at the ocean floor, the Arctic Ocean. But this is really what it's about. Okay? Um, the Arctic is mainly the Arctic Ocean. It's surrounded by eight nations that that are called the Arctic Eight, that the Arctic Circle runs through them, okay? Five of those nations actually border the Arctic Ocean. So this talk is gonna be very heavily oriented on the Arctic Ocean because that's, you can see that's most of the mass of the Arctic is actually water, okay? And who has claim to that water, who has claim to the ocean floor is really about the geopolitical debate uh, in, in this region. Um, and you can also see Greenland here, this huge mass of ice, right? It's either sitting there to grow or sitting there to melt and add water to the ocean and change sea level. So there's all kinds of interesting climate change issues around this. And the center of the debate is really what is the future of the Arctic as the sea ice on the ocean begins to disappear. Um, so um, I'm a clim climate scientist in part. I, I spent a lot of time trying to understand climate change. And this is the cover of Time from 2001. And this is kind of the way it was framed for the public, right? Here's, here's the Earth, a sizzling egg, and it says global warming, and you probably can't see this so well, but it says climbing temperatures, melting glaciers, rising seas, so the Arctic is already involved. Um, all over the Earth, we're feeling the heat, why isn't Washington? Okay, so that's 2001, all right? Now I'm gonna jump ahead, Time, five years later. This is now the face of climate change, the sea Arctic. It's, this is the icon, it's the polar bear, you know, teetering on, on the, the small piece of ice. Um, this is what many people think about now when we think about climate change. Right? It's because the north ice, this is where we're seeing dramatic change. When you have ice become water or water become ice, we can all observe that. It, 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 it doesn't take any special training to know if there's either more ice or less ice. And so the Arctic now is really the place where we can focus on climate change we're trying to understand the drivers of the change and the implications for human dimensions. But you also notice that the, the language has changed. You know, it's now be worried. Um, we're talking about tipping points. Um, we're talking about threats to health. Um, so it's a, it's a very different framing of the issue that the Arctic's right at the center of this. Okay, so um, I want to sort of paint two sides of the, the political debate that's being formed around the Arctic. Um, 
And in 2007, um, the Russians planted the Russian flag on the ocean floor at the geographic North Pole. Okay, this is the first time anyone had done that. And um, this was sort of interpreted as a, a brazen claim by Russia on the North Pole. Um, if you go to Antarctica where I work, and you go to the South Pole, what do you see? You see a U U.S. research base. You see the, the Amundsen um, Scott Polar Research Center. Okay, so the U.S. has already sort of claimed the South Pole in many ways because we're, we're there, we built this infrastructure. And so the Russians, many people view this as the Russians sticking a claim on much of the Arctic Ocean. Um, and it's about the same time Russia updated its military plans and they put increased emphasis on patrolling militarization of the Arctic Ocean. Um, and so this created quite a stir in Washington. Uh, many Arctic nations viewed this as a very bold geopolitical move, um, sort of in your face, if you will, and what's the response going to be? Um, shortly after that, um, another voice became out uh, in response to this. Um, and a, another group of, of, of scientists and, and political scientists are arguing that we have the opportunity right now, before this geopolitical race over control of the Arctic Ocean fully develops, to actually set the Arctic Ocean aside as an international commons, as a place for research, as a place for peaceful uses, much like Antarctica has now been set aside through the Antarctic Treaty System. So we have these kind of two polar views of, of what might be happening in, in, in the Arctic and in the far north, and I'd like to kind of analyze that a little bit as we go along. Um, so this was a uh, editorial from the New York Times, and talking about before the land grab goes too far, as the ice goes away, before we, nations rush in to, to garner these resources, maybe we have a chance to catch our breath and come up with a better future for the Arctic. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the science of change in the North and the approach. As a scientist, I feel that fundamentally the science around climate change is sound. We know how this works. We have good models. We have vast evidence about um, how the Earth is responding to greenhouse gases and the interactions there. Um, the problem is complex, and, and that's why, it's, as a scientist, it's fascinating and interesting, but it is complex. Um, and the models that we're developing work, but the current models around climate change and melting ice and the changing Arctic um, are underestimating the rates of change. The direction of change we can get, we can get it very precisely, um, but the rates of change are being underestimated. So we have a lot to learn, but perhaps we even less time than we anticipated before we get a dramatic change in this ecosystem. And finally, the science is pretty easy actually. The hard stuff is this. It's the geopolitics, it's the law, it's getting people together, it's getting agreements. That's the real challenge. And, and that's where I think it's, it's, as a scientist, it's exciting to work more broadly with people from other disciplines. Okay. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, over, overlapping claims to the ocean floor of the Arctic. As the ice goes away, we're going to have access to the oil and gas and mineral reserves of the Arctic Ocean Basin. That's, real, that's the goal. That's the gold rush, the resource rush in the Arctic. And we don't have a clear set of rules in many ways about who has access to that, how we're going to control that, and how do we protect that really fragile environment. So that's, that's where the conflict's involved. Um, and um, there are a lot of other things out there that we have not resolved. For example, um, a, talk in a minute in detail about the Northwest Passage, but it's, there's a potential shipping route across the top of the Arctic Ocean um, as the ice disappears. Um, Canada claims the Northwest Passage as Canadian territory. It's part of their national heritage. It moves through Canadian islands and, and uh, their lands. The U.S. sees the Northwest Passage as an international strait connecting two great oceans. And so we claim the right to be able to just sail through there Canada says, no, that these are our waters. It's unresolved. You know, Canada and the U.S. are probably not to come to blows over this, but we've not also come to agreement over this. Okay. I got into my interest in polar systems mainly through an interest in history. And I, uh, probably a lot of people, um, there, there must be a few of you out there that 
gotten fascinated by the heroic age and the explorers and reading the journals of you know Scott and, and, and Nansen and uh, the Franklin expedition. And um, if you run back into the early 1600s, this is a map of the north, okay? Um, and you can kind of see, um, here's Greenland here. Uh, this is Iceland. Here's Northern Europe. Um, and this is their depiction of the Arctic Ocean and the North Pole. And, and what do you see? You see an unknown landmass, right? But you also see a strait going through that. At the North Pole, they, they envisioned this mountain of magnetite because they knew that it compasses the point north. And somehow they thought that this, this mass of magnetite would melt the ocean, or at least provide some way to get through there. So this was the dream in the 1600s, is that you could actually get in a ship from Europe, sail straight across here, pop out in the Pacific, and you wouldn't have to sail all the way around Africa or South America. Um, you, you would save more than a year on a, on, on a sailing route and trade route. So any nation that found a way through the ice or through the north and controlled that shipping route would be, you know, be rich, wealthy, to control the seas. This was the, the, the great geographic quest starting around 1600 was the Northwest Passage, as it was called. Um, perhaps the most famous attempt um, was the, so the Franklin Expedition in 1845. And there have been many other expeditions leaving, particularly from, from England and other European countries, where they got in their sailing ships, they headed north, and they, they wanted to move through that system. And of course, they weren't successful. They just disappeared. These ships were trapped in the ice. They were crushed in the ice. Franklin left in 1845. He had two ships, the Erebus and the Terror. And they had just come back from Antarctica, um, where I work on, uh, at McMurdo Station. Um, that's Ross got that far. He got to, to the McMurdo Sound area. Um, with these ships, he came back. They were commissioned. They were sent into the Arctic. This, this was the best technology that we had at the time. You know, the, the best equipment, the best sailors, the best of everything. And, um, and everyone thought this is going to be a smashing success. Well, first off, one of the ships is the HMS Terror. And, and I don't know why anyone would want to sign on to a ship named the Terror. <laughs> this was also Franklin's fourth expedition, and he killed a good number of men in the previous three. But nonetheless, um, he had no trouble getting people to volunteer to sign up to go on this because the stakes were so high. Um, I think the best way to think of this is this is the moonshot of the 1800s. Society was completely engaged in this quest. Everyone was interested in the Arctic. Um, he sailed off in 1845, and this is now 1849. And this is an illustration from what, the London News. Of course, there's no radio, no television, no Skype, no anything else. They're, they're overdue by almost two years. And, but this is the view of what it must have been like for them, right? Here's the ship, you know, the whales are playing, you know, wildlife, abundant wildlife. You've got the aurora, it almost looks like the rainbow, you know, the pot of gold and everything else. Well, we all know the end of this is that two, two years later they began to find um, remnants of, of the team. Um, it's a great saga if you're interested in, in history and expeditions and drama and death and cannibalism and mismanagement and poisoned food and all the great things about Arctic exploration that are they're all in the Franklin expedition. So I, I highly recommend you do some research on that. So failure. But what happened is is that all kinds of people went north looking for Franklin. And so very in a very short period of time we mapped the rest of the Arctic. And so he was a failure, but in essence it was a success. We found that the map filled in the map and began to realize that perhaps there really was a Northwest Passage. Okay, so now I want to move into what we know about the Arctic now and what's happening to the Northwest Passage. Um, it's kind of remarkable, but the first satellite images of the Arctic, where we can actually look at the ice from above and see where it is, were in 1979. I mean, that's not all that long ago, actually. But in 1979, um, at the end of September, which is the minimum ice cover, right? You've had all summer for the ice to melt. This is what the Arctic looked like. And you see Greenland here, 
the north, this is the area that would need to be cleared out for the Northwest Passage, where you could go from Europe through here and across. Um, and then here, here we are in 2003. Okay. Um, you can already begin to see dramatic change. The ice is pulling back, and you can even see it's fuzzier at the edge, suggesting that the ice is thinner. All right. So sand ice gave us the first impression that the Arctic Ocean system was changing. Right. And you don't have to be, you know, you don't have, an, have to have an advanced degree in science to interpret that, right? I mean, that's a pretty obvious change that, that the public, all of us, and maybe even some politicians can understand that they are involved in thinking about the future of this region. Okay, now I'm going to jump forward a few years. Um, 2007. Um, we have much better satellites. Um, um, they're taking photographs of this region on a daily basis. And here's, here's Greenland, right, this bright, light, reflective area. Um, and here it is. Here's the Northwest Passage. It's open. Here, here's Alaska over here. So you, you could take a ship all the way through here. You know, the quest that Franklin had was unattainable. Ice choked 2007 and melted out for the first time. And the similar passage along the coast of Russia melted out except for this little, little tiny piece of here. All right. So the Northwest Passage has become attainable, not through technology, not through um, any of those tricks, largely because the Earth is changing and the ice is disappearing. So what does that mean? What, is, what are the implications of that? Um, this is a fascinating site. If you've got a lot of time on your hands, um, go to the uh, National Snow and Ice Data um, Center, the NSIDC, and you can get daily downloads of the sea ice extent um, in the Arctic. And this is data as fresh as uh, 31st of January. All right. And what this is plotting is the extent of ice in the Arctic Ocean. And these are, it's a big place. These are um, millions of square kilometers, okay? And it's showing the seasonal change in ice cover, all right, going from um, October, fall, into the height of winter here, okay? And the, uh, uh, this line here is sort of the long-term average. Right? And this is from 1979 to 2000. And the, the, that fuzzy line in there is sort of the variation. All right? So you can see that um, ice is at about a minimum in October, and then it refreezes and spreads out the extent during the winter. Okay. Um, here we are. Um, 2005, 2006 had been the historic minimum. This is right at the time when the, the Northwest Pass has melted out for the first time. Yeah, that's this green line here, All right. well below the average, well below, and here we are this year. And you can see we just crossed over the top here, but this year really represents the lowest extent of sea ice that we've seen in recorded history. And it's, we keep seeing this progression, each year seems to build on the next. So why is that happening? Um, and what do we know about this ice? Um, it turns out we actually knew a lot about the Arctic Ocean, but it wasn't available to science. All right. um, jumping around in time here, here we are during the Cold War. All right. And the Arctic Ocean at that point was mainly a place for, for Soviet subs and US subs to hide under the ice. Right. Um, this, this minimized the distance, the travel distance for a missile with atomic weapons on it for the move from either the US to the Soviet Union or back. Um, so we could hide under the ice with all these nuclear arms, but we needed, if they're going to launch, they need to break through that ice on short notice and be able to launch the missiles. So it turned out that they needed to know very accurately how thick that ice was. So um, we had years and years and years of data that actually were beginning to show a progressive thinning of the ice as the Earth was warming, and also a change in the extent of the ice. But this was all military data, all classified, and the scientific community didn't did have access to that. So, so one of the great gifts of the uh, end of the Cold War was ultimately that science began to get access to all of these old data generated by the Navy and the submarine fleet. And so we began to realize that the Arctic's been changing for quite a long time. Okay. Um, so why is that happening? And why is, 
it appear that the rates of change in the Arctic are accelerating. So I'm getting near the end of the science, but this is a, a cartoon sort of captures really what's going on here and why these changes begin to accelerate and feed upon one another. Okay, this is a U.S. icebreaker. Um, I think this is no, this is a Canadian. It's a Canadian icebreaker. Um, I think it's the Healy, and this is a uh, they froze it into the Arctic Ocean for a full year to measure changes in the ice and climate. Um, it's the first time this has been done. And um, basically, I think all of us realize that on a bright, sunny day, when you have clean, new snow, it's incredibly bright. It turns out that more than 85% of the solar energy reaching fresh snow bounces back into the atmosphere. Okay, We, we talk about that uh, as albedo. Albedo is the fraction of the incoming energy that's reflected back to space or back into the atmosphere. <laughs> So um, if you have bright light surface, it's very reflective, okay? Um, but as this snow begins to melt, this is, say, at the beginning of uh, spring, it's very cold, fresh snow, um, but eventually air temperatures warm up and you begin to get these melt ponds forming on top of the Arctic ice. Now these melt ponds are really dark, right? And dark colors absorb more energy like a black t-shirt on a warm, hot, sunny day. You know, you really feel that. A white t-shirt, you feel cooler. So um, these ponds, once they begin to melt, they change their albedo. They absorb more energy, which allows more melting. So once you start this cycle, it accelerates and feeds upon itself. So what climate change has been doing is melting is starting earlier each year in the Arctic, and it's lasting longer. So there's more and more time for these melt ponds to begin to form, to get larger, to absorb more energy, which accelerates them getting larger and larger. And in the process, we begin to eat up the ice. Okay? So this is the cycle that's now being set into motion. It's a natural cycle, but it's being accelerated because CO2 in the atmosphere is causing melting to occur earlier each year and the melt to last longer. Um, so about the last science slide, but this is, this is where it gets complex and this is where science is having trouble predicting the rates of change because of these feedback systems that I just showed you are incredibly complicated to model and understand. The physics behind these relationships are actually quite intricate and, and difficult to predict. But here's, um, we're looking at 1950, okay, this is when I was born, I'm out to 2050, so there's a century's worth of information, some of it's actual data, and the rest are predictions from our models that we, we run to understand the future. And we're looking at sea ice extent, you know, we're running that, uh, that we were looking at before millions of kilometers, and we're looking at the change through time. And here, our best models suggest that um, the uh, sea ice extent Right now, in 1950, it was about uh, 8 million square kilometers, and that by the year 2050, it'd be down less than four. So we would have lost about half of the ice in that century. Um, and that's what the model says. But this is, this is the actual measurements. And you can see that we're falling off the model. But the rate of change measured is actually much greater than what we predict. So it suggests we really don't fully understand the system that these feedbacks are taking over and rates of change um, are, are not what we expected. Um, again, as a scientist, this may seem like an academic argument, but if, if you're trying to understand uh, when the ice is going to be gone, what are the impacts on the polar bear, when will shipping start up, when will these territorial claims begin to really heat up, um, this suggests it's all going to be happening much more quickly than we originally thought. So we have less time to figure this out. We don't have that up to 2050, maybe now about to 2020 or 2025 or some smaller number. You might ask the question, well, why do we even care about the ice up there? I mean, what, what service does it provide? What value does it provide to the planet? Well, one is fundamentally is it's the Earth's air conditioner. The, the global temperature of the Earth is in part regulated by how much bright white reflective surface we have out there. We have Antarctica, we have Greenland, and we have the Arctic Ocean. And changing the proportion of bright white to dark blue ocean is one of the things that regulates 
temperature of the Earth. Right. So um, we're basically losing part of the air conditioner as that ice disappears. Um, but it affects every part of the Arctic Ocean ecosystem. Um, this is the uh, Central Arctic Food Web, and the top of it is our critter here that we all think about now, the icon of the Arctic is the polar bear. Um, everything kind of feeds into that, but the polar bear can only hunt from ice. Right? Um, the, the, the polar bear completely requires ice. When you see a polar bear on land, it's not feeding. The polar bear only feeds from ice. And as the ice goes, so does the polar bear. Um, polar bear is connected to all these creatures that are important in the Arctic. And as we'll see in a minute, the polar bear is also central to people that require subsistence resources from the Arctic. Okay? Um, the Arctic is connected to every other place. Um, and the migrations of animals, of, of whales, of fish, they move into the Arctic, they move out. Um, again, just the, the sense that the Arctic is not an isolated environment. Everything that happens there is connected to some other place. Okay, I showed you that bright white picture of Greenland. And the, the two large ice masses on the planet are the Antarctic continent and Greenland. And um, here's the map of Greenland in 1996. Um, 96. What's this number? 98. 98, 96, 98, 2007. And the red part is the portion of Greenland where melt is, was generated during the summer. Okay. So you can begin to see that the margins of the Greenland ice sheet are also beginning to melt as, as the north gets warmer. Partly because of that same mechanism, you get meltwater ponds on the ice sheet, trapping more energy, causing more melt. This is important because this is ice on land. And when this ice melts, it delivers water to the ocean, and it causes sea level to rise. Right. One of the things to remember is when the Arctic Ocean freezes and refreezes, it has no impact on sea level. Right, because that ice is in equilibrium with water. Go and put an ice cube in water and kind of do that little experiment. What changes sea level is taking uh, ice or snow on land and melting it and then delivering it to the oceans. Mm -hmm. And so um, another accelerator of change is that the rate of ice melting and icebergs calving into the ocean from Greenland is much higher than we predicted. And so the most recent estimates of sea level rise have almost doubled. Um, over the past three years of science, because we're beginning to see this rapid melting of, of, of Greenland. Um, what does that mean? Um, well, at the end of this century, we're now thinking that we'll have about a meter to a meter and a half of sea level rise. Okay, it doesn't sound like a lot, but um, think of all the billions of dollars that we've spent trying to shore up New Orleans to gain <coughs> not even that much extra protection. That, that's all gone now in, in 100 years just from sea level rise. And then all the extra storm surge associated with that. Um, uh, one of the most sensitive uh, coastal areas in the world for sea level rise is actually New England. Boston is one of the most sensitive harbors to sea level rise because of the way the Gulf Stream flows up along the coast. You add an extra meter of that water, and it piles up along the, the New England seacoast. So there's all kinds of reasons why we are actually connected to these changes. Um, and finally, in the Arctic, we're seeing this already. Um, as the ice goes away, we have open water against the coast as opposed to this protective layer of ice. Mm -hmm. And that allows storms and waves to batter the Arctic coast that used to be fairly protected. We're seeing um, Inuit villages that have been in place for hundreds of years, in some places up to 2,000 years, whaling communities, where the buildings are now falling into the ocean. Entire communities are having to move inland because of these very rapid changes. Okay. So that just, that's the science behind that. I hope that, I don't know if there are any questions about that, but uh, things are changing rapidly. We understand some of the feedbacks. Rates of change are faster than we predicted. Um, and uh, the scientific community is, in fact, um, uh, quite concerned about uh, the need consider how we're going to adapt to these changes. If we don't begin to slow down atmospheric change now, the future of the Arctic Ocean is just seriously in doubt. Okay. Now, I'm going to put it now into the economics and politics behind this. Um, this is the other face of the Arctic today, not the polar bear, but it's oil and gas development. All right. You're hearing about um, plants to drill in the Arctic Ocean. Um, these are already current development projects. Um, 
This is near Prudhoe Bay, but this is what the north slope of Alaska looks like. This is drill, maybe drill. All right, this is what we're talking about here. Um, so we're already developing these resources in the Arctic. Um, but the history of this is quite interesting. Um, the first oil was discovered on the north slope in the late 60s. All right, um, and that big field is now Prudhoe Bay. And so we found the oil. Question number two is what? How are you going to get it to market? All right. And the preferred plan by uh, Exxon and the major oil companies was not the Alaska pipeline. That was plan number two. The preferred plan was to ship it across the Arctic Ocean. Um, and because uh, they could get it to European markets and to the Northeast more quickly that way. So um, they, they, they found this, this old tanker called the Manhattan. They uh, strengthened the bow. Um, they put one barrel of oil on it. And they started um, uh, in eastern Canada and tried to sail across the top of the Arctic Ocean and back to Prudhoe Bay. It was proof of concept that they could move this oil across the Arctic Ocean through the ice. Um, it was a near disaster. Um, they had many breakdowns. The ship wasn't strong enough. The hull wasn't strong enough. The ice was too thick. And eventually, partway through, this Canadian icebreaker showed up to kind of shadow them and eventually to punch ice through here. Um, but they, they made it. It, it, it worked out. Um, but Exxon thought it was just too dangerous, and they shifted to the pipeline. Um, this is not a U.S. ship. This is a U.S. ship here. This is a Canadian icebreaker. This also opened up the beginning of the geopolitical drama in the north, because the U.S. forgot to inform Canada that the ship was sailing through their waters. All right, um, and, and 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 so you can you can kind of guess the the Canadian response to that, and the response is pretty similar today. So Canada has very strong territorial claims to the waters of the Arctic. And the U.S. has pretty much been ignoring them through this, throughout this entire period. All right. The stakes are pretty high now. Um, everyone's been running around trying to figure out what are the resources beneath that current ice. Once that ice goes away, we have access to these areas off the coast. What does it mean? What's valuable there? This is the most recent um, oil and gas assessment in, in the Arctic. And these are all different basins that they define for exploration purposes. But here's Greenland, OK? Give you a sense of that. But the bottom line is just to show you that there are all these areas that are being mapped out, explored, identified, and estimates of how much oil and gas are there. And um, the key thing here is that about one third of the Earth's gas, uh, discoverable gas resources are in the Arctic. 30% of what's left is probably in the Arctic. And maybe 15 to 20% of the oil reserves that we haven't tapped yet are also in the Arctic. So that's not a small amount of resource. Um, and you can imagine that as uh, uh, oil becomes more and more scarce, the pressures to move into the Arctic and tap these resources are only going to increase. Um, so numbers, if you want numbers. But the key thing here is that of these mineral resources in the Arctic region, 84% are offshore. Okay. All right. So as the ice goes away, the ocean's exposed. We have resources there. We have new shipping routes. We have oil. We have gas. We have fisheries. But we really don't have an organized system yet to fully regulate or manage that ecosystem. So what's in place now and what might we need for the future to result we produce a sustainable future for this resource. The one set of agreements that um, we do have is something called the Law of the Sea, or the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention. Right. And um, this is one of the largest international agreements. Um, it regulates access to resources, particularly on the ocean floor. Um, and um, it's a very complicated agreement. That applies to all the world's oceans. Um, and basically, it says that within 12 miles of your coastline, you have complete control of sovereignty, the 12 mile limit. We've all heard of that. If a ship wanders in there, um, you can take military action, whatever. You have to have permission to be there. Um, uh, you can enforce immigration customs and regulations out to 24 miles. 
we, we agreed on that. And then there's a, something called the exclusive economic zone that can go out up to 200 miles. That's the zone in which you can fish, drill for oil, tap gas. Okay, that's, that's how far that extends. Um, and this is the agreement that, that's in place to kind of create order in these large ocean basins. There's only one problem. The only major nation in the world that has not signed the Law of the Sea Convention is the U.S. Okay, so um, um, this is a major policy issue um, for the Arctic future: is that the U.S. in fact has not agreed to the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, so what's happening right now is this: the Law of the Sea Convention has a very complicated process where nations can stake claim to the continental shelves to extend out from the, the edge of their land mass. Um, there are these fixed boundaries that, that go out the varying miles. There's the 12 mile limit, the 24 mile limit, the 200 mile limit. That's all just fixed. But it turns out um, that there's a clause in there that you can go out beyond that 200 mile limit and claim the continental shelf out to the midpoint of something they call the rise. Here's the deep ocean. Here's a slope where you begin to develop continental shelf. And somewhere in the middle of that, you can claim all the way out to there. Okay? It, it, it's a legal agreement. It has no sound basis in oceanography or geophysics or anything else. But, but the lawyers got together and said, we'll draw a line there. Uh, that's fine. But what does that require? That requires that every nation go out there and map the ocean floor off their coast. And if you, can, if you can show that you meet these conditions, you can claim all this extra continental shelf as your own. And you can keep other nations out of there for drilling for oil and gas. So what's going on right now is this big race to map the Arctic Ocean floor. Mm -hmm. Every nation's out there trying to figure out if they can get more of the Arctic Ocean within their national claims. The US is doing this, the Canadians are doing this, the Russians are doing this. We're all out there doing that. What happens then is you take your claim to the Law of the Sea Convention, and then they decide whether or not they agree with your claim. And if they do, then you're, that's locked in perpetuity. That's now part of your territory. Right? So um, this is a very contentious issue. Scientists are making these measurements. But in the end, it's a legal and a political argument about whether or not your claim is accepted. The Russians did this very quickly. Um, they, they've, in fact, they turned in a claim five years ago, and the claim is rejected that the data weren't sound. The U.S. is mapping with Canada right now. Even though we don't agree to the convention, we're mapping, and we'll probably submit a claim at some point. I think the United States has accepted most of the convention as customary international yes, law. Yes, that's right. And it's the only part that we haven't agreed to is mining the surface of the deep sea, as I understand it. That's right. I mean, U.S. policy is in accordance with the law of the sea, but we've not formally ratified. Well, I've the, accepted the that as customary international law, which is binding. It, it, customary, the Senate gets all excited about it. Right, right. But, but uh, customary international law is binding on. The, the entire world, including the United States. The one thing that we haven't accepted is mining the deep sea, the, the very deep sea. Yeah, show the dawn, the so called yeah, edge. Right. The, uh, but I would also say that, that the, the Arctic, nation, Arctic eight um, nations, the uh, U.S. is one of the eight, um, are still remain suspicious over the U.S. policy by not signing on or ratifying the law of the sea. I think our their confidence in us in reaching other agreements around these resources is somewhat compromised by uh, not ratifying the law of sea, although as you say, that, that's completely accurate, that in essence it's US policy and it has international law implications for uh, uh, you know, our conduct in that region. Um, so um, this is an example of, uh, uh, here's the continental shelf and here's the slope, this is a uh, a radar sonar type image of the ocean floor. And this would be 
this would be just the, the geographic line based on distance that maybe the U.S. could claim in this particular image. But if, then if you map this and did that mid-slope rise, all of this would be extra shelf in here that you might be able to claim. It may not look like much, but when you begin to sum this up across the entire coastline of Canada, Russia, and the U.S., this is real real estate and lots of money involved. So um, if, if you extend all these claims out from the nations, and here's, this is the entire Arctic Ocean here, you end up with this area called the Donut Hole, which represents this, this deep ocean, mid-ocean resource where no nation has direct claim to the, to the uh, ocean bottom. And this is the area where there's internet, some potential for international competition contention. So um, um, where nations are staking their claims, and then there's this big piece here that its future is still uncertain. This is the part where I showed the editorial in the New York Times where people are saying, maybe the world should just set aside claims and leave this as an international reserve, much like a peace park, uh, set aside for out, uh, with no international conflict or territorial claims. It's not only the ocean bottom, there's, there's all kinds of odd little pieces of the Arctic that we fight over. Um, one of the more interesting ones is Hans Island. Um, here's the coast of Greenland. Here's Ellesmere Island, which is part of Canada. And there's an international border that runs through here. And then there's this little island that is claimed by Greenland, Denmark, and it's also claimed by Canada. And they've been trying to resolve this dispute for decades. Um, once a year, uh, the Canadians run over and put up the Canadian flag. They leave a case of whiskey or scotch behind at this cairn. And then shortly after that, um, uh, a crew from Denmark and Greenland come over and they fly their flag and they leave something behind for the Canadian friends. But um, it still shows you that there are these, these international disputes which are, we've agreed to set aside, but they truly have not been resolved. Okay? So there are geopolitical markers in the Arctic that I think in the end still mean something. Okay. So this is where it begins to get messy. As the ice goes away, um, there are all kinds of projections on increases. This is a map showing new shipping routes and when they might become available, in what time, how quickly, and the increasing commerce that's going to be going on in there. Um, and um, one of the biggest issues right now in the short, in the short term is the huge increase in the number of uh, cruise ships and pleasure ships moving into the Arctic. Um, large cruise ships that normally have been just cruising around in the Caribbean, these are not ice-hardened vessels, are now moving across you know, northern Alaska into Greenland, into the Barents Sea. Um, and we were talking about uh, at dinner tonight, uh, um, two people at the table that had previously been on the, the Lindvite Explorer, that was the ship that sank about two years ago after hitting ice in, in, in the Antarctic. So this is a very dangerous issue, moving ships into the north. And um, one of the unknown uh, issues here, or important issues, is how do we develop an international system that provides for safe passage and also protects the environment of the Arctic Ocean. Um, another key issue are certain special locations in the Arctic Ocean. Um, this. Um, Here's, here's northern Alaska, here's Russia, and we have a choke point here um, near the Bering Strait where everything comes together in a very shallow set of waters. It's very narrow. It's a key migration point for whales. Um, indigenous cultures are, are highly reliant on whaling in the Arctic, circumpolar Arctic. Um, um, Whales need to move through this place into the Arctic Ocean and then south on a regular basis. And as shipping begins to increase, um, we already have evidence now that the that collisions in the sounds of propellers, et cetera, are significantly interfering with the migrations of the bowhead whale. Um, and so um, as we begin to think about more and more oil and gas development here and up on the North Slope, and then needing to move those resources in and out of these choke points, these are very important issues, both um, ecologically, environmentally, but they're also vitally important to the indigenous communities in the north who uh, 
don't necessarily have a balanced relationship and decision making in these regions. So let me talk briefly about some of the institutions that might help us out of some of these potential messes around where do we develop oil and gas, who makes those choices, um, how do we protect the health of the ecosystems, how do we regulate commerce in the Arctic Ocean. Um, so we have, we have nation states. Um, there are eight Arctic nations. The U.S. is an Arctic nation. Um, you know, but probably if I ask 30 students at Dartmouth, you know, is the U.S. one of the Arctic nations? I don't know, probably 30% of them will probably get it wrong. They can't <laughs> that the Alaska's part of the U.S. and the Alaska border is the Arctic. That's a lot to put together geographically for many people. But we are an Arctic nation, and um, um, our politics often don't reflect that, but we are an Arctic power. Um, and um, more recently, there's something now called the Arctic Five. Um, the Arctic Five are the nations that actually bound the Arctic Ocean. Um, and so there's a schism between the Arctic Eight. The eight, the eight come from um, uh, Greenland, Iceland, um, Norway. Um, the Arctic Five are you know Russia, the U.S., Canada. Um, I'm missing the other two, but these are the nations that are actually have a claim to the seabed floor. Um, we have all kinds of intergovernmental organizations that are engaged in trying to resolve these issues. That, and the primary one here is the Arctic Council. This is an intergovernmental um, organization of the Arctic Eight. Um, it, it has uh, power to make assessments and do studies and make recommendations. Okay? But it has no power to enforce anything. Sound familiar? It's a bit, a bit like the UN, but uh, uh, but it is an important organization in that regard uh, for bringing up issues. If you look at the members of the Arctic Eight, um, countries like Canada, uh, uh, Denmark, Greenland, uh, Russia, they have people with the title ambassador <laughs> sitting at the Arctic Council meetings. The United States, we have a, a representative from the Oceans Division of uh, the State Department. She's excellent. Um, but she does not carry the title of ambassador. And so the U.S. has had a very ambivalent participation in the one organization that's supposed to help solve problems and oversee the future of the Arctic. And I think it's in part that the U.S. doesn't want to see power to that organization. Um, in some ways, they want to be involved, but they don't want to raise the level of this organization. They prefer the U.S. to be sort of a single lead power in making choices and decisions and not cede sovereignty to the Arctic uh, Council. Um, there are all kinds of other organizations, and the NGO community is clearly interested in the future of this. Um, we talked a little bit at, at dinner tonight about the importance of indigenous people's organizations in reaching decisions about the future of the Arctic. And within the Arctic Council, there are a number of these, what they call permanent participants. And um, the, the most, probably the, uh, most important one is this, the Inuit Circumpolar Council. The Inuit are the people that, that ring the circumpolar north. These are people that traditionally are whalers or live off marine mammals. Um, there's 50, there's uh, 150,000 Inuit on the planet. They're not a lot of people, um, but they have a very important tradition, very important culture, and um, uh, they feel that they have very important rights to decisions about the health of the Arctic Ocean, because they are an Arctic Ocean culture. Okay? Um, and so one of the major geopolitical issues right now is how do we develop agreements and structures that allow indigenous voices to be adequately and fully represented at the table. Uh, the Arctic Council is trying to do that by having these permanent participants. They sit at the table, but at the end of the day, they don't vote. There's only nation states that vote. And this is a very complicated um, problem for, for all of us. Um, the next important problem, um, and it's, it's becoming more and more pressing, is within the Arctic Council, we also have observers, nations that, that state a claim of interest in the Arctic in its future. Right. And right now, um, the, the recognized observers are France, Germany, Netherlands, Poland, and the United Kingdom. All right. um, but there's some really you know, movers and shakers that aren't there. 
all right? And the European Union wants in. There's a lot of oil, there's a lot of gas, there's a lot of commerce up there. They would like to have a stake in those decisions through the Arctic Council. And then, it's really interesting, there's China and Korea, all right? Um, if, if you look at the, you think of the Arctic and the Arctic Ocean, and you think about ships, you naturally begin to think about icebreakers. Right? And if you look at the icebreaking capacity of the world today, the U.S. icebreaking fleet is broken. They're, they're, we, we, I was at McMurdo Station a month ago, and they have to cut an ice channel to let the resupply ships come in for food and oil. And uh, when I started working there in the late 80s into the 90s, it was the U.S. Coast Guard Polar Sea and the Polar Star. And we haven't seen those icebreakers in seven or eight years. They're in dry dock. They're beyond repair, probably. Um, we've, this year, we were renting the Swedish icebreaker, the Odin. Three years ago, we were renting we rented an icebreaker from Russia. The U.S. has no icebreaking capacity. Um, Canada is building up their icebreaking fleet. And the most modern icebreakers right now are being built in China and Korea. <laughs> and, and it's because they see they see the future. They see where 30% of the world's natural gas is. They see where this oil is. They see where the fisheries resources are going to be as the oceans warm and fish migrate north into the Arctic Ocean. Um, and they want in. They want into the Arctic Council where these issues are discussed, and they want a voice. Okay. Um, and then the NGO community also has observer status in certain ways. And um, probably the main um, and many of these are indigenous organizations, but probably the main organization right now is WWF. They've taken a very strong interest in the future of the Arctic Ocean and have invested quite a bit of resource in uh, funding studies and trying to make their voice heard on the future of the Earth. Um, if, if you're trying to envision what's going to happen up there, we have these two scenarios. One is that uh, there's going to be a race for resources for oil and gas. Uh, Nations like Russia are going to be very aggressive in staking claims that the military will be active in the Arctic Ocean and that there's a level of conflict that um, is going to pervade all discussions about the future of the Arctic Ocean. Right? But the opposite end of that is that um, we have enough time to come together to realize that as this system changes, as the ocean melts, as, as, as this system becomes accessible, that the international community has a chance to get it right. And you come to cooperative agreements about management, about research, research, about resource use, and perhaps even an agreement to just set it aside, right? to agree to leave it alone, which is in part what we've done on the Antarctic continent. So um, these are the, the possible futures, if you will. I mean, this is an exaggeration of, of what might happen. But here's the Arctic race where we have a high demand for resources, um, but we, we, we support this gold rush for resources. We have poor, weak governance. We have no agreements. And, and on the other side, um, maybe we end up with low demand. The economy is pretty slow right now. One of the things that sort of helped the Arctic is the, is the global downturn in the economy. Um, a lot of oil and gas projects are on hold right now. The number of ships being built to move into the Arctic has slowed down. We have a little more time now to maybe figure this out. Um, so, so maybe we're sort of stuck in here where the demand is low. We're not sure, quite sure what we're going to do. And this is kind of this murky kind of middle range. Um, maybe, maybe we could end up here. The, 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 this is, you know, this is have your cake and eat it too, maybe. That there's high demand, but we have good governance. Good, good regulation that we can sort of move a sustainable development model into the Arctic, and it's a win-win for everybody. Okay, and then finally, there's um, this issue here. Maybe the stakes are low enough that we're willing to get together to agree to leave things alone, right? And 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 um, develop a, a strong, stable international agreements to create a polar preserve. Okay? So I think um, I think what we're going to see now moving ahead is a very lively debate about where we want the Arctic Ocean to go, or where, where, what kind of future do we envision for this ecosystem and for the people that depend on it, for the livelihood 
and for the indigenous peoples of the North in particular. And we've become deeply engaged in the issues around climate change and security and policy in the North. And I've run a, a number of workshops and meetings um, involving sort of the high level leaders here. This is, this is Julie Gorley here, who is the uh, uh, senior Arctic official for the Arctic Council. Uh, Ken Yalowitz from the Dickey Center, I think, has spoken here to this group. Uh, Bill, Wolf, Bill Wolfler from the Douglas Government Department. And this is James Collins, former uh, U.S. Ambassador to Russia. Uh, so uh, the good news is people are really trying to engage in this debate and trying to develop some reasonable ideas for the discussion. Uh, coming out of our, our work at Dartmouth, we, we published widely a number of recommendations that we think might advance some of the, the, the debate, at least from the academic and policy side. Um, this will never happen, uh, number one. Um, number two is to strengthen the Arctic Council. I think most people involved in these issues feel that the one thing that we do have is the Arctic Council. We need to take on a serious debate about observers. We need to increase the, the power of the indigenous organizations within the Arctic Council. I'm speaking from we being, I think, a lot of people, but this is, these are opinions that I, I, I agree with and come to, to reach. Um, the U.S. has to clarify its role in the UN Law of the Sea. We, we, we would gain from our colleagues if we were eventually ratified that. Um, we've been close. Uh, there was discussion that up till the, the change in, in the Senate that we might have been able to do it in the first two years uh, of the current administration, but I think that's kind of slipped by us. Um, and um, the, we need a lot more coordination between the scientific community and the policy community to kind of move our current science knowledge into a discussion in a way that's actually usable or understandable by the people making decisions about the Arctic future. So um, this is my last slide. So this is, this is the, the scare story. You see a lot of this in the press about conflict in the North, about Russia, about, um, and this, you know, it goes back to you know, the flag and the big ships and moving across the sea and the militarization. Um, I think most of us that are engaged in this debate um, think that the institutions are in place to deal with most of this. Um, what's, what's required is a commitment to use the institutions and some very important but doable um, retrofits or add-ons to make these institutions stronger. Um, and finally, I think this, uh, from the U.S. perspective and U.S. policy, um, continuing education to help people in the, the lower 48 to realize that the U.S. in fact is an Arctic nation, that we participate in this international arena, and that what happens in the Arctic actually has importance to our lives here in the South. So. Uh, you've been very patient, and I, I'm, I'm sorry the light's been off so long, but, but thank you very much. I'd be happy to uh, take questions or uh, engage in any kind of discussion you'd like. Thank you. So maybe in the back then? When we, where we have not, if we have not ratified it, right. what, for the rest of the world, what, what rights do we have? I mean, the gentleman in the front said we respect most of the, of the conditions right. as traditional, but right. from those who have signed it, do we have much less rights? Um, we will eventually, because if... The only way that we can get uh, our claims to the extended sea floor are binding us if we accede to the law of the sea. So that's my understanding anyway. Could our, could our claims be recognized without having ratified the convention? We have, a, we have a, an expert on this here. Right? Well, not an expert, but there is <coughs> President Reagan who refused to sign the law of the sea. Later accepted it as customary international law. And in a case involving boundary between uh, the United States and Canada in the Gulf of May, both parties agreed that the law of the sea was binding on them. Mm -hmm. So there is one exception that we do not recognize as uh, customary international law. And that has to do with the deep sea. Right. I'm not sure just the boundaries of that. Right. But otherwise, uh, the, uh, the United States has accepted it, and, and customary international law is just as binding as if it had been signed. Right, right. The, 
well, for example, right now the U.S. and Canada have a dispute on boundaries um, of, of, of ocean floor within the 200 mile limit. Mm -hmm. And we're actually working together. We have Canadian scientists and U.S. scientists on the same ships mapping the ocean floor. The idea being that we would resolve that conflict at the time at which we put forward our claim to the law of sea convention. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's more cooperation than there is conflict. And when you read the papers off it, it sounds like that, that everyone's ready to you know, go to war over this. I think there's a high degree of cooperation, but the institutions um, need strengthening. There are vulnerabilities here, and, and Russia is deeply suspicious of our interests in the Arctic. The Arctic is Russia's frontier. They've said that this is the, going to be the resource basis of the future. The Arctic is um, the way for Russia to develop its interior. There, there's, there's no access to much of Siberia. The only access in Siberia is through the great river systems. And the way you can move up and down the rivers with large ships and develop uh, uh, industrial base and oil and gas is along the coast and then using that base to move inland. And they've been doing that back into like the 30s, I think. They have. And, and, but, but, but they see that as that's the future. One of the things that's happening now is that there are, I think there's something like a dozen cities of over 200,000 people uh, along the uh, Arctic coast in Russia. And those cities have been decreasing in size for the last several decades. Um, and Russia is trying to figure out how to reinvigorate the industrial base around the ocean as well as as par partially as a means to increase extraction of resources, particularly minerals and timber from the interior. So, so Russia's, Russia sees the Arctic as very central to their future, and they, they, they're deeply suspicious of U.S. Arctic interests and U.S. as an Arctic power. Because we have the summit. Um, in part, but th they, they realize that, um, um, yeah, that, in part, that's, that's, that's one. And there's national prestige involved, too, in, in being a power player in the Arctic. And, and these international boundaries and agreements have that, that, that at stake as well. But would be practical, perhaps, to far-flung future generations. Uh, I've read once that uh, if we were not warming the globe now, we would be entering into an ice age because of other um, geo factors. Um, do you know if that's true, or do you think that's true? And the, the other question that I have is, uh, at some far-flung future date, perhaps, uh, would, the, would humanity be unable to continue to warm the Earth, and would we then suffer a rapid decrease in planet temperature? Well, there are, there are fairly well understood climate cycles related to variations in the Earth's orbit, the tilt of the Earth, and the wobble of the Earth. And we can, in analyzing ice cores that extend back on several hundred thousands of years, we can see these, we can see these regular ice ages and warm periods and ice ages and warm periods. So we, we kind of know that those cycles are in there. Um, one of the, um, but there's a, one interesting change in climate that people are, are um, looking at very closely now that relates to the circulation of the oceans. Mm -hmm. and it's it's called thermal hailing circulation. But the Earth's energy is redistributed from the, the tropics to the north by the oceans. The oceans are the big engine that redistributes energy. And so there's this big pump that moves water north and south and, and exchanges heat with land and with the atmosphere. And what in part drives it is cold water um, in the far north because cold water sinks, and that sinking water provides the force to kind of move all these currents around the Earth. And, um, and one, if you shut down that ocean circulation, then what happens is the warm water piles up near the equator, and the North gets colder and colder. Um, and one of the best ways to shut down that water is by melting lots of ice and having fresh water override the dense saline ocean water forms a cap, presents, prevents that sinking of the water, which fuels the pump. So um, we think that, in part, variations in the amount of fresh water delivered to the Arctic Ocean in the past have broad scale implications for climate in faraway areas, and particularly Europe. 
Um, and uh, uh, we've seen in, in a number of instances that, that there are these signals of rapid uh, desalinization of the Arctic Ocean through uh, fresh water being delivered rapidly, either from melting ice or from uh, uh, glacial lakes that have backed up large lakes that suddenly <coughs> flow into the Arctic Ocean. So we, there, there are possibilities for cooling as well as warming. Um, and, but certainly on a, a geological time scale, um, we're, we're likely to have orbital variations probably swap out climate change unless we've already burned the place up by then. Right? Way in the back. Wondering how far out is the, is the point where the problems we have created by fossil fuel burning and greenhouse gases become a greater challenge for mankind than the problems we are solving by burning and creating fossil fuels. It, it's, yeah. got, it's got to happen right. sometime. Right. Well, when I started just uh, maybe six, six or seven years ago, I developed this polar course at Dartmouth. And, you know, I was telling my students that, you know, the, the climate projections for the opening of the Arctic Ocean in the summer for commercial shipping would be around 2070, you know. Um, if you go into the literature now, there's one paper that predicts 2013. Um, the, I, you know, the smart money's on 2030, perhaps. Okay. And, and the, so that, that, that shows you just how quickly the Earth's atmosphere and these feedbacks to the yeah. climate system are occurring. <coughs> um, so, um, and the other, the scary part is, is there's huge inertia in the system, right? All this CO2 that's piling up in the atmosphere is going to be biting us for, you know, the next century before we even have any chance to really begin to, to either sequester or recycle that. So, um, um, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's a big concern. And I, I don't have a good answer to that except that uh, we know that these feedbacks exist. And the sooner we take the problem on, the, the, the better, better off we will be. No question about that. Yeah. Also in the back. Given the perceived benefits of the open Arctic, right. does that say something about nation motivation to prevent global warming? You know, in some ways, do they see this as a, a, right. like a gain rather than a loss? And, and so what is the motivation in this loss? No, that's a really good question. And I, I, I suspect that, in fact, there are people that, that would see that. I mean, what we're talking about is removing this ice barrier for uh, resource extraction in the Arctic to obtain more fossil fuels, which will melt more ice, if you will, right? Um, um, it's hard to demonstrate or prove that maybe perhaps that's going on. But I think a lot of people are not interested in the problem because of that. They see economic gain. If you talk to people that, that live in the north, they, they have a very mixed view on this. I mean, when you, if you go into Alaska and ask people about these issues, you'll find that communities are heavily split on this. You know, um, uh, uh, communities may be very engaged with oil extraction and development see economic benefits of that, and schools and health care and, and uh, better living conditions, et cetera. And then you'll find a community 100 miles away from that that's deeply dependent on fishing and whaling. And, and they see this as an utter disaster to have shipping and oil development in, in the Arctic Ocean, that their entire livelihood, that the food level will be contaminated, their way of life will go, their language is threatened. So it, it, it is. It's very difficult because people in, in very close proximity to one another can have very extremely different views of this. The, the one view, my colleagues in Greenland, um, uh, members of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, um, um, they, they, they see these changes as inevitable. Um, and, but their perspective, it's very interesting. They, in a sense, they do blame the South, us, for this problem. Like in Greenland, there's 55,000 people, 85% of them are Inuit. Um, and and their, their whole economy and their whole standard of living and their whole culture is, is rapidly changing by this. I mean, they're receiving that change in many ways. Um, um, and you would think that they would be incredibly bitter over this. They're, they're certainly not happy. But at the same time, um, they see themselves as a tremendously resilient culture. 
that the Arctic is warm and cooled over the last 2,000 times. There's been periods when travel across the north have been easier and times when they've been more difficult. Um, I think the, the challenge is, is around finding adaptive and resilient responses, right, that preserve the important aspects of the culture. Um, they realize that they're not going to reverse climate change and that it's coming, and they're trying to find a way to be out in front of it. And, but what they would like is a full voice at the table, right, um, about decisions, <laughs> about which issues require action, and, and they, they don't want to be the passive receivers of this, this environmental damage. Yes, please. I very much appreciate your picture of Bering Strait and the shipping that goes through and whales and having seen pictures of the back of whales cut by propellers, sliced rhythmically, if you will, and whales dying from noise, um, noise pollution particularly from the Navy, um, but just noise pollution from shipping, and I know that it, it, I think I've heard that the noise pollution off of Boston Harbor is an issue with the East Coast whales. But how on earth, in that tiny area, whales can survive coming from the o open Pacific into the Arctic and back on their annual migration? It's a huge issue. It's a, they say it's a choke point for both economic and, 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 and biology and the ecology of the whales. And, well, and the noise, yeah, because right. the noise kills whales. Right, and, and also the uh, uh, oil and gas exploration involves setting off uh, explosives and, and charges for the sonar depths. And, so. and have, have any whales beached because of it, or do they just go down to the bottom and never be yeah. seen? Well, I think, I think there's good data that suggests that Whales are sensitive to the noise, that they may move from areas of high noise. I, I don't think there, there's a lot of really solid information on, on whale mortality associated with that. Well, but we know Cindy, that whales are, are sensitive to these noises. Cindy Green has um, a lot of scientific data. So the, the, uh, the fundamental issue, is for, for example, the people in, in North, northern Alaska, Canada, and, and those that are engaged in whaling is, um, what information is actually used in reaching those decisions? Uh, uh, it was a curious case a, a number of years ago when um, they were trying to set the, the whaling quotas uh, of uh, northern Alaska, and uh, uh, the Inuit community of Barrow and the other whaling communities in Alaska said that no, there are many more whales than you say are migrating through the area, and it turned out that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service people were looking for the whales in a place where the whalers knew they weren't migrating. They said, no, the, actually the whales go through here. And with, with that traditional knowledge and that local knowledge, when it finally became made available, the Fish and Wildlife Service came in and changed where they were flying their planes and were looking for the whales. It turned out that was exactly the case. So I think one of the, one of the issues that's very important in the North right now where do we get the information? Who holds the information? And how, how does traditional knowledge of these ecosystems translate into making decisions and policy? And this is a really a interesting and challenging topic for, particularly for traditionally Western trained scientists like myself, working with policy people. And then you have this problem, and then you have a whole different community and a different way of knowing and understanding the world coming in and saying, well, no, we, 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 we have a different view of the problem. We have information, too. We want it to be part of the process. And so there's a, a really interesting, the uh, US is engaged in this. Canada is sort of ahead of us. Um, but the Arctic Council is beginning to incorporate these other, these other sources of information. And, and non-traditional scientists becoming more engaged in, in these policy choices. 
likelihood, or what would you suggest as far as putting a more, more a human face on this issue? Because it seems to me that during the last two um, terms of George Bush that it was a huge, huge obstacle. I worked with the Guichin, and so they were trying to, you know, put their face in the D.C. area and like come to them and say, "This is what's happening. Our livelihood, our lifestyle is being seriously threatened." But it was like pulling teeth to get anyone to even sit down with these people in D.C. because it's totally like just disconnected in the United States. I know Canada has a much different stance on it, but like, what would you suggest would be a good process to put a face on this issue for the indigenous co communities? Because that, the way that you just said that, you know, the Inuit of the Greenland, I think you said, right. is that's very progressive. Right. And I think the United States doesn't understand that, you know, that they're willing to work, or at least those people are willing to work with you know, the decision-making process. They just want some autonomy. I, I, I'm not sure where you can begin to answer that. It, it, it's, so, it's so difficult. I think, um, you know, I guess I'm a professor, I would say more education, right? Um, uh, but it, it's really about communication, and you're right. It's about what is the message and who's delivering it, and then how do we engage people in thinking that this is a serious problem. We talked about the fact that I think the average citizen would might have trouble identifying the U.S. as an Arctic nation, right? And and so so that alone is a problem, right? That we don't identify uh, with our northern heritage, and that, that Alaska is often seen as a different place, right? A different place politically. It is a different place, right? And in, in, in Congress and in the Senate, and so Alaska often pro pro projects itself into Arctic policy. Um, but remember, Alaska is part of the rest of the U.S. And so U.S. policy may not align with Alaska's interests or Alaska's interests in the Arctic. And um, as I say, the U.S. has not had a strong Arctic policy or a strong interest other than through the Alaska delegation. Mm -hmm. right? And you have such a divide also with like the Sarah Palin sort of government, that sort what? of, and then the you know, more liberal like preservation idea yep. on the other side. My backyard is different from your right. backyard. So. And, that, that, and that's, that's what's so complicated in Alaska is you have pro-development and then you have sort of preservation. Communities, you know, communities split along those lines. And then the, 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 other, the other part of this story that's difficult, I think, for, for many people to realize is the importance of subsistence or mixed economies in these areas. And, and people rely on the environment that most of us don't even imagine is possible or it still happens. So it, it, it's a tough sell to suddenly begin to identify with why someone is so concerned about whale migration or how many salmon there are or whether or not there, there's mercury in, in, the, in the blubber and the fat that they're feeding the children. I mean, it, it's, it's very hard for many of us to relate to those issues. Yes. Uh, I've got the thought listening to you that uh, increased attention and resources might come to the problems of the Arctic uh, if, if it's realized uh, that the Arctic problem provides a tremendous opportunity for us to learn about a very complex system that has tremendous transfer value to many of the other problems facing the world. Because you're talking about uh, cooperative conflict resolution in which a scientific input is very important. There are many other problems in which the scientific input is important. Uh, the models are good, but not perfect. Uh, you're talking about uh, negotiation in a cooperative vein among governments, but also getting down to people and developing connectedness with the other. Uh, all of these things are going on in a, in a very difficult problem, but far less difficult than a number of problems I can mention around the world. Oh, oh. No, Therefore, it's a great opportunity to learn right. how to live together, and I think if we convince people in Washington that that's the case, that this has right. a tremendous payoff beyond just the Arctic, although that itself is very important, maybe you can get more attention, maybe you can get a sub-cabinet, maybe you can get things going, and people will be talking about the transfer value. Okay, how can, we, how can we use what we learned here someplace else, whether it's in the Middle East or some other location, 
to do things better in the world, how we all live together. Well, I, I, I agree. I think that's an excellent comment that um, I mean, we do have the Art of Council. We have a set of governance bodies. We have an opportunity to discuss these issues. And the stakes are high, but they're not overwhelming. So we, there's focus and there's interest. The numbers of people involved are actually fairly low. And, and we, as you say, we have a good understanding of the directions of change. Um, if you begin to think about U.S.-Russia relationships, if there's one area that we ought to be able to collaborate on, it probably is around the Arctic Ocean, right? The, the geopolitics of that, uh, the stakes of hitting that uh, are, are, are different than other international conflicts. And uh, a lot of people propose that the Antarctic Treaty System where Antarctica has been set aside, international claims have been set aside, they've been made, but they've been set aside. There's a set of common, there's a common treaty system agreement that, you know, used for peaceful purposes. Uh, there's free access, um, you know, there, there's these mechanisms to manage Antarctica well into the future. Um, the Arctic has some of those properties about it, and that's why some people are calling for this, this ocean commons. Um, this, this area managed internationally and collectively for peaceful uh, and common benefit. Um, the, the complexity is the oil and gas. I mean, it, 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 it's almost too bad <laughs> that that oil and gas is up there. That's, that's going to be the driver of the future still, unless we can find some other way to... to Another element is like water. There's so many conflicts over water resources right. and water is becoming scarcer and scarcer. So th there's, there's a synergy right. between developing a, a complex, but still you can get your hands on the Arctic right. and some of these other problems around the world. And if we alert people's uh, consciousness to this in, right. in Washington, maybe you can get more support right. and more attention paid, especially if you go out of your way to make transfers of what you're learning there, perhaps to other people who are involved elsewhere with other problems. But you do have a very rational set of players here. If you look at the, the Arctic nations, you know, in terms of governance, their economies, their past bilateral relationships, I mean, you're dealing with, you know, the U.S. and Canada. Ru Russia's the wild card, but otherwise you're dealing with, you know, Norway, Denmark, Greenland, um, Iceland. You know, th th these are nations that actually function well, work well, and have lots of other agreements already um, around resources, fisheries, education, research. So you're right, there's a really a strong platform to build on. One of your recommendations was improved communication between scientists and policymakers. Right. Can you speak a little bit on how you think that can happen, especially considering everything that's in the way, like the economy and all these other things? Right. You know, I guess as an academic, the, I think one of the key ways to do that right now is to actually begin to train scientists to be better communicators with mm -hmm. policymakers. And also, to understand how decisions are made and who, who the stakeholders are, and, and to begin to understand how research is actually used in that process or not used. Um, and so, uh, uh, Dartmouth, we have a new program in, on polar environmental change that's, that, that's a big part of what we're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to help graduate students do a better job than I did in talking about the science and then trying to, sorry, and trying to make that relevant. Um, Training students really early in their careers to be able to, to do that, to be more effective, to, to how to train a student how to write an op-ed. I mean, that's not something I learned to do in graduate school, but um, that, that, that should be just basic training for scientists is to communicate mm -hmm. much more effectively and, and learn that early. Um, I mean, so that's one way to do it. And in, in, in the immediate run, I think, you know, scientists just, we're, we are getting better at getting out on the road. Um, uh, and the national science organizations are putting more emphasis on that. Well, through senior scientists, I mean, there are workshops, there are schools, um, I, you know, where you can go learn these things now if you want to do that, and, and people help you do that. So I think that's the key thing. I mean, I'm, it's really about partnering. The other side of this is look at who we have in government, right? We don't have very many scientists in the Senate. Or in the house, there are a few. They tend more often they're doctors than, than say environmental scientists or physicists or chemists. So we also we also need to work that out a little bit. I mean, I think the policymakers also have to come and be willing to really learn some of the science uh, uh, and actually spend a few minutes 
instead of reading the, 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 just the briefing page, to go beyond that and look at, you know, who did the science? How good are they? Right? Who funded them? These are, you know, so it works both ways, but it, it is getting better. It is getting better. Could I just have a quick clarification of who got to be part of the Arctic Eight and how much of that was a political decision? How much was a geographic decision? And, and who were the five and who were the eight? Oh, okay. Well, the, the Arctic Eight was formed in, uh, I think, 1996, mid-90s. It's a young organization. It's an intergovernmental forum. Okay, so um, the, it, it is a state represented organization. So it's the U.S. Department of State picks our representative. To say the, most of the other nations have uh, people from the government holding the rank of ambassador that, that are there. So the Arctic Eight are the, the, are the eight nations that have territory that extends above the Arctic Circle. Okay? And the Arctic Five are the five nations that actually have border on the Arctic Ocean. Okay? And the, the important part there is that uh, two years ago, the Arctic Five had their first meeting about the future of the Arctic Ocean, all right? And um, so they excluded the other three nations um, from those meetings. And that was viewed as a major snub to the Arctic Council. And in fact, in Canada, uh, the US did not participate in that meeting. And Canada hosted and held the meeting. And um, Secretary Clinton actually issued a formal rebuke to the Canadian government. It was the first rebuke um, in like 30 years or some ridiculous amount of time. Uh, and, and since then, the, Ar the Arctic Five have agreed to sort of rejoin the Arctic Eight, if you will. They, they issued something called the Alulisat Declaration that, was, that the Arctic Five did. And basically, it was a, that, that we will use the law of the sea to adjudicate any conflicts over the uh, Arctic Ocean. So they've agreed that there's a platform there. We'll use that. It's sort of OK. But they were also sort of saying that we're the five that really going to determine the future of the ocean. That's what that was. And that's how it was perceived. So the Arctic Eight and then the EU and other nations said, wait a minute, you're not playing fair here. So these are still the, the, the pressure points in that. You know, people are, nations are still staking out claims very subtly and sometimes not so subtly. And, and that's why we still have more work to do, but as Mel said, I think the, the, the potential, the upside is very high as well. Yeah. Yeah. Is it Sweden and Finland that joined yeah. the Yeah. Yeah. I know uh, Canada has developed policy in, um, in that actually acting on beefing up its uh, military presence um, in the Northwest Territory. And um, to, to lay claim to their sovereignty and support it. Uh, it. Has the U.S. had any plans or indications of doing something like that, do you know? No, I mean, the, the first, when Harper came into power, his first speech, you know, recently was about yeah. um, increasing Canada's, uh, protecting Canada's rights in the North. And they made, and they announced, the, I think, five new ships, five new ice-breaking ships. Um, and so Canada's very engaged in this and sees this as vital. To say the U.S. ice-breaking fleet is in disrepair, it's, uh, uh, these, are, these were Coast Guard ships, but the Coast Guard got put under Homeland Security. Homeland Security was not interested in the, the role of the Coast Guard was interdiction, uh, immigration, and drugs, not in punching holes in the ice. So um, we, we, we've kind of pulled back, and even the Navy um, has not been so excited about the Arctic Ocean um, after the demise, the, the Russian submarine fleet is gone. I mean, it doesn't exist, really. So, so the Navy has kind of pulled back. So that's what I'm saying. We, the, the U.S.'s engagement in the Arctic is, is sort of uneven, um, and uh, we haven't made the kinds of commitments that I think some of our partners would actually rather know what we want to do up there, uh, perhaps, than with this kind of lack of engagement, but waiting in the wings to step forward. Kind but, but yeah, I think, I think the U.S., we have an Arctic policy. It was issued in the final days of the Bush administration. It, it, uh, it's been 10 years in the development. It was issued in the final two weeks. Um, no major breaks in policy. Um, 
uh, from, from the previous audit policy, but it, 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 it did indicate that uh, the U.S. would cooperate internationally, um, that the U.S. military had rights of passage in the Arctic, et cetera. Uh, but we're not investing in the Arctic, I guess is the better answer. Please join me. Thank you.